Wings of Russia Studio presents Of Russia documentary. Reconnaissance Aviation is a branch of the Air Force designated to perform aerial reconnaissance with the aim of discovering enemies' alignments, means, and forces, as well as various facilities in the tactical, operational, and strategic depth. May 1971, Israel and Egypt are in the state of ongoing confrontation. All of a sudden, Israeli air defense discovers two aircraft over the Sinai flying at high speed and altitude. Missiles sent to intercept fail to hit the targets. Alerted Israeli Air Force Phantoms returned with no result. The detected aircraft did not reveal any combat intentions and within minutes after an attempted attack over them, left the Sinai airspace. Those were the brand new Soviet reconnaissance planes. Reconnaissance Planes – The Sky Outwatch Curiosity is a natural human feature. First air balloons and then airplanes significantly expanded abilities to have this curiosity satisfied. But very soon careless curiosity gave way to mercantile interest. Indeed, in the time of war, flying above, one can have a bird's view on the entire position and sometimes of the intentions of the enemy. Air balloons were the pioneers of reconnaissance aviation. The Russian army used them already in 1904 in the war against Japan. However, after a short while they gave way to aircraft, mobile and less vulnerable to the ground fire. To perform reconnaissance tasks at the battlefields of the First World War, Russia used mainly the French Voisin and Farman low-speed two-seat aircraft. Just imagine what hardships the first reconnaissance pilots had to go through. A bulky photo camera was supposed to be put on the side of the aircraft and held aimed at the target. Aerial photographing means photographing of the land surface from flying aeronautic objects or aircraft. The airflow was hitting and throwing the lightweight plywood fabric covered plane like an autumn leaf. Therefore, the use of the heavyweight Ilya Muromets aircraft for the purposes of the long-range reconnaissance was deemed rather helpful. The most striking episode of their reconnaissance work was photographing of the Austrian-Hungarian positions during the preparation for one of the most important operations of that war, the Brusilov of Breakthrough. It was the diligent aerial reconnaissance that allowed the Russian forces to disrupt the enemy's front line and produce a sensible damage. The benefit from the use of the aerial reconnaissance pilots in the World War was not left unnoticed. Therefore, as soon as the country of the Soviets recovered its strength to produce aircraft of its own, its first serial aircraft was the R-1 reconnaissance aircraft of Nikolai Polikarpov. It was made on the basis of the English de Havilland 9, which was being produced in the 20s in huge amount. In 1927, the R-3 reconnaissance plane of Andrei Tupolev was put in series. It was the first serial all-metal aircraft made in the Soviet Union. In those years, there was a real boom of the record-breaking flights. The first national aircraft, the pride of the Soviet country, could not stay away. Reconnaissance planes, among other aircraft, performed many internal and international flights. The 30s in the USSR were marked with a tremendous growth of the aviation industry. The national engines production was developing and the aircraft of national design were being put in series. In the beginning of the 30s, the outdated R1 and R3 gave way to the R5 reconnaissance biplane of Polycarpov design. The aircraft became a classical type of reconnaissance plane. 
At the International Contest of Tehran, it took the first place among the aircraft of such designation. It was easy to fly and quickly became popular among pilots and technicians. In 1934, R-5 took part in the salvation of the Chelyuskin expedition. The aircraft was subsequently modernized by equipping it with a more powerful engine. That's how RZ appeared. In the same years, Tupolev made a twin-engine multipurpose R-6 aircraft, which designation, among other things, was reconnaissance. 1937. Pilot Pavel Golovin, for the first time in the world, flew over the North Pole on R-6. In 1936, in Kharkov, designer Josip Neman created R-10 reconnaissance aircraft. It was based upon the cantilever monoplane with detachable chassis. Its speed reached 380 km per hour. It was in full compliance with its time. The aircraft was put into serial production. Reconnaissance at sea borders was carried out by the flying boats MBR-2 constructed under the supervision of Georgi Beriev. A flying boat was constructed in Moscow under the supervision of Georgi Beriev aimed at the sea border protection. The aircraft was identified as MBR-2. Note that all reconnaissance planes on service in the Red Army at that time were capable of performing only close-range reconnaissance in the frontline zone. On the other hand, the Soviet military doctrine of that time assumed that the enemy will be destroyed with the help of heavy bombers acting in the enemy's deep rear. However, Air Force did not order aircraft for the long-range reconnaissance. For example, the qualities of the world-known ANT-25, which could have become a good long-range reconnaissance plane, remained unclaimed. All issues with respect to the armed forces' development were being resolved not in the course of the theoretical discussions, but through directives from above. In March 1939, speaking at a party congress, Defense Minister Voroshilov stated that together with the general quantitative growth of the air fleet, the light bombing, attack and reconnaissance aviation was reduced to fault. Return to reality from the underestimation of reconnaissance happened quick enough, already after the first real test. In the Soviet-Finnish war, which started in the end of 1939, the Soviet forces, unsecured by the aerial reconnaissance, suffered huge losses from the smaller Finnish army. Entire divisions got into encirclements. Reconnaissance squadrons started to be immediately formed, equipped with the SB bomber, aircraft which were not at all made for reconnaissance, but capable of staying in flight for quite a long time. Experience of this brief war, which ended in March 1940, showed that reconnaissance is one of the most important elements in the preparation and conduct of military operations. Structural reformation started in the Air Force. Among other things, aviation units were formed for the performance of various types of reconnaissance, including the long-range one. They were equipped with the R-10 and the SB reconnaissance planes. In 1941, the SB aircraft was regarded as a temporary measure. Although it had significant altitude and range, this bomber had a lot of deficiencies. The main among them was its minor armament. Those aircraft were supposed to be substituted by Yakovlev II and Yakovlev IV, however, in reality, the latter appeared to be even less capable than the SB and quickly left the stage. The Soviet reconnaissance aviation was caught unprepared for a big war. Germany, on the contrary, long before the intrusion, Luftwaffe reconnaissance aircraft performed accurate research of the near-border regions of the USSR, offhandedly entering the airspace of this country. The real meaning of those flights became clear already in the first days of the war when the German bombers destroyed the major amount of the Soviet aircraft including reconnaissance planes located at the disclosed Soviet airdromes. Therefore, data delivery on the troops' movements in the enemy's rear drastically reduced. The Red Army Command often hardly knew what kind of forces and in which directions were consolidated by the German Army. 
In spite of the losses, reconnaissance crews worked day and night bringing information of the enemy. And thereafter, everything depended on the work of the headquarters of the ground forces. Somewhere intelligence was quickly taken into account and troops were capable of countering the German troops' offensive. While in other places there was mistrust and intelligence was checked and rechecked, which in the quickly changing situation did not lead to success. In certain cases, commanders wanted to see only favorable reports and if they did not comply with such willingness, they suspected a current of panic and threatened reconnaissance pilots with military tribunal. Aerial reconnaissance brings the most valuable and precise information. Aerial reconnaissance is a complicated and dangerous military art. Reconnoiter travels in the sky alone, he relies only upon himself. Hiding behind the clouds and using the sun as a cover, he comes from where no one expects him to come. He has just seconds at his disposal. Dashing over the target, he has to see everything, remember, take snapshots and mark up the map. At that time, of all the aircraft suitable for such purposes, the most suitable was the Petikov II frontline bomber. Understanding the importance of aerial reconnaissance, the Soviet command was intended to restore losses as quick as possible. However, by the beginning of 1942, the total amount of reconnaissance units in the Air Force of the Red Army, as well as the amount of trained crews, was still insufficient. The Petlikov II aircraft were insufficient even for the bomber units. Other types of aircraft started to be used for reconnaissance as well. For example, the Illusion 4 bomber, with photographing equipment installed, was turned into a fairly good long-range reconnaissance plane. During the Stalingrad battle, fighters used for the close-range visual reconnaissance and the Polycarpov II light bombers used for the night reconnaissance showed their best qualities. Looks like the Germans themselves taught the Red Army command how efficient aerial reconnaissance could be. Soviet soldiers knew for sure appearance of the frame, the German focke 189, over their positions did not mean anything good. The bombers flying after it would hit the targets with high precision. This aircraft had everything aimed at the most efficient performance of reconnaissance tasks and first of all the perfect overview from the cabin. Strong defensive armament and maneuverability made it a die-hard for the fighters. It was very difficult to hit the frame and it was considered to be a big achievement among the Soviet pilots. The quantitative and qualitative growth of the Soviet reconnaissance aviation by the end of 1942 and, what was more important, the more significance given to aerial reconnaissance, undoubtedly became important factors of the breakthrough in the war. Formation of new air regiments were in full speed in 1943. Situation with aircraft improved. There was no more deficit with Petlikov II. Illusion 4 and A-20 Boston and B-25 Mitchell American bombers sent over the land lease were performing reconnaissance flights. Every minute is precious. The country impatiently awaits intelligence. There comes Senior Lieutenant Kolesnikov. Ten minutes ago he was flying over the enemy's positions. He reports on what he had seen to Lieutenant General Hrykin and Major General Vikharev. Collection of intelligence in large quantities and its proper analysis allowed to timely disclose enemy's preparation for the general battle of 1943 at the Kursk Duga. While beginning from 1944, there was not a single offensive operation conducted without the prior diligent reconnaissance. Illusion II attack aircraft and fighters' reconnaissance modifications were mainly used for the close-range reconnaissance. The long-range reconnaissance was, as before, performed by Petlikov II and Illusion IV, as well as by the new Tupolev II bomber. Aircraft were equipped with photo cameras with the perspective aerial photographing. 
Perspective aerial photographing means terrain wideband photographing by several aerial photo cameras with different angles of tilt. The end of the war in Europe was marked by the Siege of Berlin. The downfall of the last fascist stronghold was preceded by a very detailed aerial photographing of the Berlin defense region by all the power and strength of aerial reconnaissance. There was no time for the development of new aircraft. All strength and efforts were thrown at the production of the A-bomb and means of its delivery. Suhoi-12, a piston engine reconnaissance and artillery fire spotter entering tests in 1947 was probably an exception. Its outlook definitely revealed signs of the German frame. However, jet aviation was more and more entering its rights and the piston engine Suhoi-12 with its velocity of 500 km per hour was no more responding to the demands of the time. In the West, the first post-war years became the time of the reconnaissance aircraft violent development. Special attention was paid to the development of strategic reconnaissance. As a matter of fact, almost right after the Second World War, the former Allies entered the Cold War between themselves. The Soviet Union became an object of careful attention. The first post-war generation of the American reconnaissance aircraft was manufactured on the basis of the long-range piston engine bombers and passenger aircraft. Those aircraft constantly flew along the USSR border trying to peep into its territory. Having understood that the Russians practically had no chance to intercept them, they started to fly deeper inside. The enemy was most of all interested in the regions where developments of the missiles and atomic weapons were on the way. It was a kind of a cat-and-mouse play in which reconnaissance aircraft attempted to escape interception thanks to their high speed and altitude. The end of the 40s was marked by the aviation transition toward jet engines. It was then when the first jet reconnaissance aircraft appeared in the USSR. MiG-15RBs, developed on the basis of a fighter, had nothing special. While Illusion 28R was a more serious aircraft becoming the basis of the frontline reconnaissance aviation of the mid-50s. This bomber-based aircraft was capable of reaching up to 900 km per hour and an altitude of 12,000 meters. Such characteristics for the time being were quite enough to escape modern fighters. Thanks to additional fuel tanks, the aircraft's flight range reached 3,150 kilometers. Illusion 28 reconnaissance aircraft were equipped with the most modern, as of the time, photo equipment, allowing to perform plan and perspective aerial photography. Subsequently, it was equipped with hardware for the electronic reconnaissance. Electronic reconnaissance is identification of the location, type, and designation of the radio electronic means of the enemy on the basis of their parameters and emitted signal. The Illusion reconnaissance aircraft served no less than 10 years in the Russian Air Force. By the end of the 50s, the velocity of the aircraft significantly increased, going beyond the sound barrier, and Illusion 28 lost its actuality with respect to speed, altitude characteristics, and the reconnaissance equipment contents. The defense was no more a rescue from the fighters of the potential enemy, which arsenal by that time contained guided missiles. The militaries required a maneuverable and high-speed tactical reconnaissance aircraft. Development of such aircraft started at the Alexander Yakovlev's design bureau on the basis of Yakovlev 25 barraging interceptor. However, tests showed that Yakovlev's reconnaissance aircraft did not have any sufficient advantages over the Illusions one. The issue was therefore limited to only 10 aircraft. Yakovlev was thinking of a more sophisticated, a supersonic aircraft. 
the aircraft was set in serial production in 1958 under an identification of Yakolev 27R. Besides more advanced flight characteristics, equipment of this aircraft allowed to perform photographing at supersonic speed. While there were a lot of aircraft for the close-range reconnaissance, the problem of the long-range reconnaissance was resolved only with the appearance of the Tupolev-16 bomber. A long-range reconnaissance aircraft was made on its bases in two variants, for daytime and night reconnaissance, differing one from the other by the set of equipment. Pods with the radio electronic equipment were suspended on the pylons under the wing while photo cameras were put in the fuselage. Later, a detailed radio intelligence station was located in the same place. In the second half of the 50s, Tupolev 16R started to serve at the long-range reconnaissance regiments. They also served in the naval aviation. Unlike its onshore variants, the naval ones were equipped with a more powerful radar. It was in the Navy that such aircraft demonstrated its best qualities. Their main task was to look after the aircraft carrier groups of the probable enemy. Photos depicting the Soviet reconnaissance aircraft passing close to the American and British aircraft carriers could be often seen in the Western press of the 70s. Carrying radio electronic equipment, Tupolev 16R, were used for the observation of the situation over the Soviet nuclear grounds. Radiological aerial reconnaissance means reconnaissance with respect to the character, range and extent of the radiological contamination of the terrain and airspace. In summer of 1956, the Pavel Tsibin Design Bureau made a proposal to build a reconnaissance aircraft identified as the RSR. It was supposed to have unprecedented flight characteristics, altitude of 25,000 meters and velocity of 2,700 kilometers per hour, which were significantly exceeding characteristics of Tupolev-16. This conditioned the unusual form of the aircraft. The extent of originality appeared such that from the beginning of the development of the construction and the onboard systems of natural size flying model had to be built. The aircraft underwent flight test in 1959. However, when it came to the issue of putting the aircraft in serial production, the state policy accent was shifted toward missiles and many prospective aircraft developments were closed. The fate of the new reconnaissance aircraft had no continuation. It is clear that for the task fulfillment, the reconnaissance aircraft must stay invulnerable. Designers of Tupolev 16R made an accent on the speed and defensive armament. The American Boeing Company took the same path in the course of RB-47 development. However, there were other reconnaissance aircraft capable of climbing to an altitude unreachable for the interceptors. They were the ones high-altitude armless spy aircraft, which from the end of the 50s caused continuous headache to the USSR leadership. The most known among them were the American Lockheed U-2 and Martin RB-57, as well as the British Canberra. The widespread wing enabled them to fly at an altitude of over 20 kilometers. In the second half of the 50s, several hundred episodes of the USSR border crossing by the NATO spy aircraft were registered annually. On May 1, 1960, the cat and mouse play was brought to an unhappy end for the Americans. The U-2 spy aircraft piloted by Francis Harry Powers was brought down by Soviet missiles. Attempts to produce a high-altitude spy aircraft were made in the USSR as well. The resolution of April 18, 1958 in this connection was deemed so important that it was classified twice by science, highly confidential and top priority. 
Design works were assigned to the Yakovlev Design Bureau. Having taken the Yakovlev 25R reconnaissance aircraft as the basis, designers changed the wing. The aircraft was equipped with two high-altitude engines of Tumansky. The aircraft was identified as Yakovlev 25RV, where V signified altitude. 1959. Test pilot Vladimir Smirnov piloting Yakvalev 25RV set a world record by taking a cargo of one ton to an altitude of 20,456 meters. Interesting that the aircraft was planned to be armed with a gun. It was supposed to be taking down its foreign colleagues at an altitude of over 20 kilometers. The drifting air balloons were supposed to become the targets, the new means actively used at that time by Western intelligence. Subsequently, for the workout of the ground and airborne interception complexes based on Yakult 25 rv a high-altitude radio-guided target was developed. The high-altitude reconnaissance is a unique thing. However, the main routine work was performed by the frontline reconnaissance aviation. Its evolution followed the pure classical path. Reconnaissance aircraft were developed on the basis of the fighters and bombers coming from the service with minimum changes in its construction. Flight velocities were growing and reconnaissance equipment was improving. In the end of 1960, development of the Yakovlev 28R frontline reconnaissance aircraft started on the basis of the Yakovlev 28 supersonic bomber. The test sample construction was completed in 1962 and the first serial aircraft were issued in 1966. This aircraft turned to be the most successful among the Yakovlev 28 series. It had numerous modifications for the performance of highly specific tasks. Reconnaissance equipment of this aircraft included television cameras. Television aerial reconnaissance means collection of the data on the enemy with the help of a TV camera transmitting real-time information. One of the most successful fighters of the 60s, MiG-21, also had a reconnaissance version. Equipment was located under the fuselage in a compact suspended pod. The pod was exchangeable depending on the task to be resolved. MiG-21R became the first tactical reconnaissance fighter in the USSR on which besides optical, electronic reconnaissance means were used. In the same years, the new generation equipment was located on the long-range Tupolev-16 reconnaissance aircraft. However, starting from the second half of the 60s, the altitude velocity characteristics of this aircraft became insufficient. In the long-range reconnaissance aviation, it was assumed to be substituted by Tupolev-22R supersonic aircraft. In practice, the new aircraft did not substitute but supplemented the Tupolev-16 and the aircraft of both types constituted the basis of the long-range reconnaissance aviation of the Soviet Union until the end of the 80s. The main task of Tupolev-22R was to exercise radio, electronic and photo reconnaissance over the enemy's territory, as well as to track down naval units. This aircraft was being modernized throughout its entire service. New models appeared with the more updated equipment and expanded capabilities. For the range expansion, these aircraft were subsequently equipped with the in-flight refueling system. After the Caribbean crisis, the NATO Navy made its activity in the world wide waters more active. Capabilities of the new long-range reconnaissance aircraft in service in the USSR were not always enough. Therefore, from the mid-60s, neutral waters patrolling tasks were assigned to Tupolev 95 art a naval reconnaissance aircraft. The 180-ton aircraft with four powerful turboprop engines capable of staying in the air for over 20 hours was an ideal means of strategic reconnaissance. Based upon Tupolev-95 bomber, this aircraft was equipped with the most efficient at that time long-range reconnaissance and naval operational target detection system. Aerial operational target detection means data transmission of the nature, location and activity of the target. 
Staying in continuous contact with a potential enemy, Tupolev 95 Art C could not help becoming a popular character with the Western press. The press called this aircraft the Eastern Express for its capability to quickly appear in practically any point of the world. Long-range aviation as well obtained a limited number of Tupolev 95MR versions. Equipped with powerful photo cameras, this aircraft within 20 hours can photograph almost the entire territory of Western Europe. A special place among reconnaissance means was occupied by the unmanned aircraft. Until ballistic missiles became a reliable striking force, the missile aircraft were made as an alternative thereto. However, when the missiles obtained a full-fledged nuclear sword status, the missile aircraft immediately found a new job – reconnaissance. Such unmanned aircraft, with no life support systems on board, could fly farther and faster. The first light unmanned Lavochkin 17R was based upon the target aircraft and accepted for service in 1962. The launch was performed from a ground or automobile unit with the help of solid fuel boosters. In flight, this aircraft was automatically piloted in accordance with a set-in program. Reconnaissance results arrived for processing after the aircraft return. The Yastrib-1 long-range reconnaissance complex, including the 35-ton unmanned Tupolev-123 reconnaissance aircraft, was accepted for service in 1964. The range of 3,500 kilometers enabled it to perform photographic and radio-electronic reconnaissance of airdromes, ports, naval bases, industrial facilities and launching sites in the enemy's deep rear. Upon the aircraft return, container with the intelligence data would detach and brought down on a parachute. Unmanned aircraft appeared to be quite a perspective direction of the reconnaissance aviation development subsequently turning into a new unmanned generation. But this story lays ahead. In the meantime, let's get back into the 50s when the NATO reconnaissance aircraft were barraging the airspace of the Soviet Union completely unpunished. Success of the high-altitude reconnaissance planes and U-2 in particular made a powerful kickoff for the development of counter means. Spy aircraft irritated the Soviet leadership so much that by the beginning of 1960 an idea was born of a high-altitude and high-speed interceptor capable of putting an end to the outrage of the Americans. The Mikoyan Design Bureau had a good groundwork in the development of such aircraft. It was assigned to create an interceptor, which subsequently was called MiG-25. The assignment assumed outstanding parameters. Velocity was to exceed the speed of sound almost three folds, and the flight altitude was to be 25 kilometers. It would have been a pity not to create a reconnaissance aircraft with such parameters. The prototype of the reconnaissance plane was ready even earlier than the interceptor. In spite of the futuristic task, the prototype was built just within one year. On March 6, 1964, test pilot Alexander Fidotov put the aircraft into the air. A lot of emerging problems had to be resolved in the course of tests. Due to significant heat up of the aircraft at high supersonic speed, designers had to create a powerful cooling system that would impact the reconnaissance equipment as well, while the high altitude urged designers to develop a more sophisticated photo equipment. The same year, the militaries issued an assignment to modify the reconnaissance plane into the reconnaissance bomber version. MiG-25RB was capable of carrying up to 10 half-a-ton bombs and destroy targets from an altitude of 20 kilometers. MiG-25RB is designated to resolve tasks of aerial photographing and electronic reconnaissance as well as to produce bomb strikes over the enemy's facilities within operational depth. Already in autumn of 1971, five aircraft and crews were sent to Egypt. The first test flights over the Egyptian territory were performed in March. 
While starting from April, they flew over the occupied Sinai Peninsula and over Israel, including its capital, Tel Aviv. Raids were conducted at an altitude of 20 kilometers at a speed of 2,800 kilometers per hour. Photo equipment of the aircraft allowed to take high-quality shots with tiny details. Several times, Phantoms were trying to intercept the MiGs, but they had no chance in catching up with the reconnaissance plane. Neither the Hawk air defense missile complexes in service at the Israeli army. In fact, with the creation of MiG-25, there started a new stage in the development of the Soviet aviation reconnaissance. It was on MiG-25R that the navigation equipment was based upon the digital computer equipment. Reconnaissance complex of the aircraft allowed to perform control over a large area, determine geographical coordinates of the target with high precision and perform real-time data transfer. Potential of the MiG-25R construction enabled to use it as a basis for the development of numerous reconnaissance planes versions. They were entering service together with the upgrade of the reconnaissance equipment. Radar reconnaissance tasks shall be performed with the help of the Sable side looking station. The Sable station is designated to obtain intelligence through mapping the territory. The Sable station operation is performed entirely from the Pelling DM complex, linking the obtained mapping to the topographic map. The Middle East events allowed to test the aircraft in real combat conditions. However, MiG-25 was not the only one possessing outstanding characteristics. By the end of the 50s, having sensed that the Soviet countermeasures against the low-speed U-2 will soon be found, the U.S. government ordered Lockheed to produce not only a high-altitude but a super-fast strategic reconnaissance plane. The plane was called SR-71 and named the Blackbird. Fantastic look of this aircraft coincided with the no less fantastic flight characteristics. Altitude of over 25 kilometers and speed of 3200 kilometers per hour. With such characteristics, it was practically invulnerable for the Soviet interceptors. The cat and mouse play reached a new level. Although Americans stopped flying into the Soviet airspace, the U-2 scandal of 1960 was still memorable. Besides, it was not clear about the stage of readiness of the new Russian high-speed interceptor and about how far was the progress in the Soviet air defense missiles. Therefore, both the American SR-71 and the Soviet MiG-25R for many years performed reconnaissance tasks flying mainly along the contact borders of the two world systems, the capitalist and the socialist. As of today, SR-71 remains the fastest aircraft in the world. Its speed record of 3,529 kilometers per hour has not been surpassed. MiG-25 also has several absolute records. For example, no existing aircraft can beat its record of climbing to 37,650 meters. The main path of the reconnaissance aviation development consisted of two components, evolution of aircraft and evolution of the reconnaissance equipment itself. As to the first component, this or that successful aircraft construction of other designations were taken to serve for reconnaissance purposes. For example, civil aircraft having one feature important for reconnaissance a spacious fuselage to host equipment and operators, as well as significant flight endurance. Americans, for example, have developed a number of wide designation RC-135 reconnaissance planes on the basis of the passenger Boeing 707. In the Soviet Union, the military cargo Antonov-12 and the passenger Illusion-18 made the basis for different types of reconnaissance aircraft. The reconnaissance version of the Illusions airliner was identified as Il-20. The civil Antonov-30 aircraft, which main designation was to perform mapping, could also be used as a military photo reconnoiter. 
Beginning from 1981, Antonov 30 was used in the military action in Afghanistan. It performed visual surveillance and targeting for the combat aviation, photographing of the bomb and strike regions and spots of the airborne troops landing, as well as to rescue the hit aircraft and helicopters. As before, for tactical reconnaissance, aircraft with minimum refurbishment were used. Thus, Sukhoi 17M3R and 17M4R, built on the basis of the fighter bombers of the end of the 70s. Those aircraft proved their efficiency during the Afghan war. Another reconnaissance aircraft of the Sukhoi Design Bureau appeared in 1980 when at a certain loop of progress, both in the Soviet Union and in the West, there started development of the aircraft capable of performing combat tasks at low and critically low altitudes. At such flights, aircraft stood long unnoticed by the enemy's radars. With the appearance of the Sukhoi 24 frontline bomber adapted for the activities at low altitude, its reconnaissance modification Sukhoi 24MR was developed. This aircraft can carry out tasks day and night in any weather in a wide range of altitudes and velocities under conditions of the enemy's radio electronic jamming. All delivered and transmitted intelligence is used consistent with the navigating flight parameters. Another form of reconnaissance to which aviation had direct relation was the radar early warning. The radar early warning is detection of the flying aircraft and on-ground targets with the determination of their characteristics and coordinates at a distance of up to 1,000 kilometers. In the mid-50s, there emerged the problem of protecting the northern borders of the USSR, the direction of the most probable U.S. attack. Construction of a network of ground radar stations within a short period of time at such a long range seemed unrealistic. The way out was in the establishment of the Airborne Radar Surveillance. Work started in 1958. The aircraft development was assigned to the Tupolev Design Bureau. Tupolev 114 airliner with its voluminous fuselage was selected as the carrier. The antenna dimensions conditioned by the signal power consumption did not allow to locate it inside the aircraft. Therefore, it was mounted on top of the fuselage in a disc-shaped pancake cover of 11 meters in diameter. Radar operators' workplaces were equipped inside the aircraft. The early warning radar detection aircraft with the Liana complex was identified as Tupolev 126 and was accepted for service in April 1965. This aircraft provided for the reliable detection of the airborne targets coming at high and medium altitudes long before them approaching the missile launching range. The aircraft had an expanded onboard complex of means of communication and navigation which provided for the data exchange with ground and vessels based command posts. By the end of the 70s, the most acute problem was the detection of the cruise missiles, minor low-flying targets following the terrain shape at high speed. Tupolev 126 was incapable of resolving this kind of task. Beginning from 1984, the new A-50 aircraft started its service. It was developed on the basis of the Illusion 76 military cargo aircraft which dimensions allowed to host the Schmel complex designated for the performance of the early radar control. Like its predecessor, A-50 carries a pancake with an antenna inside. Apart from detection, this aircraft serves as a means of navigation and operating management. Capabilities of its equipment allow to track down 60 targets at a time and navigate 10 to 12 fighters there too. Introduction of such aircraft allowed to establish a continuous radar field along the borders of the USSR and significantly increase the air defense efficiency. Similar NATO complex is known as AWACS. The unmanned reconnaissance aircraft development also found its continuation. 
in 1976, the RACE reconnaissance complex with the Tupolev 143 unmanned aircraft was accepted for service. It is used for the reconnaissance performance in the frontline zone at a depth of 70 kilometers and is equipped with the exchangeable reconnaissance tools. The photo reconnoiter registers intelligence on board and deciphers it upon return. The TV reconnoiter transmits intelligence to the ground command posts in real time. A more powerful Strish complex of the same design bureau with the Tupolev 141 unmanned reconnaissance aircraft appeared in the beginning of the 80s. Its main designation is the operational and tactical reconnaissance. Development of radio electronics made reconnaissance equipment more light and compact, significantly expanding its capabilities. This allowed to minimize the size of aircraft. For example, the remotely controlled Pchila aircraft with a weight of just 100 kilos developed at the Yakovlev Design Bureau in 1985 is designated to perform surveillance over ground targets. Its onboard TV camera transmits images to the ground control post in real time. The flight duration of this device is two hours. This reconnaissance device was used in the combat activities in the Chechen Republic. The Schmel unmanned device accepted for service in 1997 became Pchila's further development. In spite of its light weight, this device can perform practically all types of aerial reconnaissance. In the course of the entire Cold War, activities of the Western intelligence never stopped. Changing were only the means. The main upon them in the 70s and in the 80s were the high-altitude drifting reconnaissance balloons. To fight them, there was M-17 aircraft developed at the Misishev Experimental Engineering Plant. Subsequently, a reconnaissance aircraft was built on the basis of this machine. The new aircraft was identified as M-55. The plan was to develop a whole reconnaissance and attack complex, however, by that time the Soviet Union was already in the fever of perestroika. There were less and less funds allocated toward military developments and intentions in the foreign policy were to pass from confrontation toward peace. M-55, under the name of Geophysica, immediately turned into a pure civil aircraft. Now its work is to research upper layer of the atmosphere including the ozone layer as well as to monitor the ground and sea surfaces. Currently most of the tasks of strategic intelligence is placed upon the spy satellites. Capabilities of modern equipment allow to view the enemy's secrets from outer space in every detail. However, in spite the seemingly unlimited abilities of the modern orbital reconnaissance complexes, aerial reconnaissance is still in demand. All these years, Americans never stopped upgrading their notorious U-2 spy aircraft. Its efficiency was increased by equipping it with the more and more sophisticated reconnaissance devices. In 2003, a brand new unmanned aircraft, Global Hawk, was accepted for service in the U.S. Air Force. This flying robot performs the entire flight from takeoff to landing in an automatic mode and can spend 36 hours in the air covering 22,000 kilometers. The Russian Army service today, together with the intelligence veterans MiG-25, includes A-50 airborne early warning aircraft, Sukhoi 24MR frontline reconnaissance aircraft, and the unmanned flying devices. Nowadays, functions of early warning, tactical reconnaissance, and other aircraft targeting can be performed by fighters. Thus, a quad of MiG-31 interceptors is capable of controlling a 900-kilometer-long frontline airspace. A modern reconnaissance aircraft built on the basis of Tupolev 22M3 missile carrier now serves in the long-range reconnaissance aviation. The world has changed a lot by the 21st century. There is no more global confrontation. Former Cold War enemies communicate freely at international exhibitions. 
once secret NATO aircraft fly into the once no less secret aerodrome of the Flight Research Institute in Zhukovsky to take part in international aviation and space salons. In spite of all this, new developments in the sphere of aerial reconnaissance continue in many countries, since without reconnaissance, even the strongest army will trifle away its efforts. <laughs>